Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we would get in here and then we would, you know, uh, go kind of uh, probably out in the garden. Um, so it's a big pleasure to welcome and introduce Brian Lehman. Um, he will talk about geometric characterizations of big cycles. Great. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the chance to speak. I am very glad to be here. Um, so let me start by giving you the setting for the talk today. Throughout the talk, x will be an integral projective variety over an algebraically closed field. So we're allowing it to have singularities. Um, then let me remind you, a k-cycle on x is a formal sum, say, sum from i equals 1 to r of a i z i, where here the a i are supposed to be integers, and the z i are supposed to be k-dimensional subvarieties. of x. So uh, a k cycle is just a k dimensional equivalent of a, of a v divisor. Okay. Um, then we say that a k cycle is effective if all of the ai's are non-negative. Okay. So it's exactly the same setup as for divisors. Then um, we're going to be interested in putting an equivalence relation on k cycles, and we're going to use numerical equivalence. So let me remind you, um, numerical equivalence. Well, normally people talk about numerical equivalence for smooth varieties, but you can talk about it equally well for an integral one. Um, what this means, um, I'll be a little bit imprecise. Numerical equivalence is defined by intersecting cycles against churn classes. Of vector bundles. OK. So um, on a smooth variety, you can intersect cycles against other cycles. But you can't on a singular variety, necessarily. Um, so if you go back to Fulton's book, for example, um, you'll see that sort of the natural setup is this one. OK? Um, so um, you can think of the churn class simply as being an operator on, say, child groups of cycles. And then, you know, so, um, so you define a cycle to be numerically equivalent to 0 if it you know, caps to 0 against any, any polynomial in churn classes of vector bundles. OK. Um, so the result of doing this, so I'm going to call nk of xz to be the set of k cycles up to numerical equivalence. Turns out that this is a fin finitely generated free abelian group. And therefore, it's a lattice inside of nk of x, which is defined to be nk of xz tensored up to r. So eventually, we're going to do some kind of analysis on the space, and so we want our coefficients. OK. Um, so if you like, you can think of this as being, you won't lose much if you think of this as being homology. So you can think of the subspace of, say, singular homology um, spanned by classes of cycles. That's OK for, for this talk. Um, so what we'll be interested in is the following object. The pseudo-effective cone, which is, I'm going to denote like this, fk of x living inside of nk of x, is the closure of the cone generated by classes of effective cycles.
Okay, so again, the, for, for most of you, this will be a very familiar object when it comes to divisors. Um, so, you know, we're very used to thinking of the pseudo-effective cone of divisors. And um, as you know, it's very important in sort of, uh, say, capturing the geometry of x. Um, so these other pseudo-effective cones, um, they're not studied as much. There's much less known about them, but you can still sort of make this definition. It's a very reasonable one. Um, and, you know, I claim that these, these objects, just like for divisors, they sort of capture interesting features of your variety. And so you'd like to understand them. Um, so what do you need to know about the pseudo-effective cone? Well, um, the things that you hope for are true. So it is full dimensional, basically by definition. Um, and it contains no lines. This is sort of the key point. You know, so uh, when, you have a, when you have a pointed cone in a vector space, you can think of it as sort of choosing out a positive direction. Um, so this, the study of pseudo-effectivity is sort of known as positivity of cycles. That's what we're going to be studying. OK. Um, one more definition. Uh, well, um, y we're going to use the existence of ample divisors over and over again. Yeah, so far, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So this is a pseudo effective cone. Uh, one last definition the interior of the pseudo effective cone is known as the big cone. So again, we're just going to keep notation for divisors and use it for cycles. <laughs> no, bigger. Okay, let's try again. Yeah, that looks better. Thank you. Yeah, much better. So the basic goal of this talk, where we're going to be headed, is the following thing. We'd like to give a geometric characterization of the boundary of the pseudo-effective cone. Yes, question. It's convex. Yes, um, it's convex because it's, you know, we, we took a class of generators and we, you know, closed it off. That, that will make it a convex cone. Yeah, good question. So, yeah, so it's just a, you know, it's just a convex closed pointed cone inside of a vector space. Very sort of natural thing. Okay. So given that we'd like to study this cone, um, sort of the basic question that we'd like to answer is, what does the boundary of this cone look like? If somebody hands you a subvariety or a cycle, how can you tell whether it's on the boundary or the interior of this cone? Um, so that's the basic problem facing us when we're trying to think about this cone. And um, this is guided by the following principle. Um, so the principle is that a class A pseudo-effective class lies in the interior, is big, if um, for sufficiently large integers m, m times alpha is represented by effective cycles that move a lot in some sense. Okay, 
So this is the hope. Um, there's a number of conjectures making this principle precise. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is maybe the first sort of theorem, sort of establishing this in a very general situation. Um, but this is the idea. And it's based on sort of familiar, familiar facts for dividers. Um, so let me remind you of the first few instances of this. Um, so for divisors, um, so let's suppose, just to make our lives easier, that we have a smooth variety for the moment. And L is a Cartier divisor on X. Then uh, the volume of L is the following thing. So it's defined to be the limb soup as m goes to infinity of the dimension of the space of sections of m times l over m to the n over n factorial. So here, sorry, n should be the dimension of x. Okay. So again, for many of you, this will be a familiar construction. So, um, so what, what's going on here? Well, um, so this is saying that the bigness of L, so the dimension of the space of sections is somehow measuring how much L moves in the linear series. Um, but its bigness is not captured just by the space of sections, but you need to look at multiples of L, and then somehow measure their asymptotic growth as M increases. This is essentially picking off the coefficient of M to the N in the growth rate of these spaces. That's what this is. So why, you know, why, why is this the right thing to do? Well, by this principle, you know, what the, the geometry of L itself might not reflect um, its bigness, but you need to look at high multiples. You know, this is, um, this, this is sort of reasonable, right? We're asking a very sort of, we're asking a cone type question, right? Bigness is not really an invariant of, of alpha, but it is of the ray that it spans. So if you're asking a cone type question, you should expect a cone type answer. So you need to look at the entire ray and then if, if you do this, you will, in fact, get some sort of measure of bigness. So um, I guess I haven't said yet why we care about the volume. Uh, it turns out that L has big class precisely when the volume of L is positive. Okay. So um, this is how we're going to capture the notion of moving a lot for a divisor. Um, the next case that I want to talk about is a case of curves. So for curves, there's also a um, criteria for bigness, which is maybe a little bit less well known. So the following theorem, let me write it first. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's take a deep breath. This is a Bauer, Campana, Echo, Quebecus, Petronel, Rom, Sensberg, and Volzel. Um, so this is a theorem with, by these authors. Um, so it says that a curve class alpha is big if and only if, let's see, how do I say it? Um, for some positive integer m, any two points of x can be connected via an effective cycle of class m alpha. So um, again, this is sort of in line with the same principle. We don't look just at alpha, but at multiples. 
And uh, what does it mean to be connected? It means that there's some chain of, of curves of class alpha. So you can actually uh, step from one point to any other. No. Yeah. So you can actually step from one point to any other via sort of a connected chain of cycles of that class. Um, so in the theorem that they proved, there are some assumptions on singularities. But I think that um, the theorem should hold true without. Um, let me give now one more example. So this is an example due to Voisin, which is highlighting maybe the difference of this sort of higher co-dimension stuff from the case of divisors, which is more familiar. Um, so Voisin's example says that a subvariety with ample normal bundle need not be big. Okay, so this should be something of a surprise, right? And it's very different from divisors. Um, a subvariety with ample normal bundle, somehow we, we think of that as being a, a subvariety which is positively embedded. Um, but it's this sort of positivity notion coming from vector bundles is somewhat different from the positivity I'm talking about today. Okay. So um, here's an example. So you let x be the variety of lines in a cubic fourfold. Say y. And set v to be the subvariety of lines in y cap h. So here y is some generic cubic, hyper, uh, cubic fourfold. h is a generic hyperplane. Um, and then it turns out, so you can, you can actually work this out in this situation that V and H has ample normal bundle, but is not big. Okay. So this leads us to, to look for some other approach to understanding bigness of cycles geometrically, somehow. Um, you know, the first thing that you'd guess would be maybe to look at the normal bundles, but that doesn't give quite what we're looking for today. So we have to do something else. Um, so, so I'm being a little bit sloppy here. So. The question is whether this theorem holds also for singular varieties. I think the answer is yes, but I would need to sit down and think about it to be sure. So you're saying that it's false? No, no, no. I'm yeah, no, no, yeah. I, I, this is true, the line must be. Yeah, true. that's right. That's right. Maybe I should think about it more carefully before <laughs> going out on a limb. Um, why don't we talk about it afterwards, if you're interested? What was that? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so maybe, maybe that's not quite true, but um, all right. So I thought about sort of trying to be coy and sort of leading up to this, but I'm just going to tell you what works. Um, there's no reason to beat about the bush. So um, what I'm going to talk about today in this next section is in response to a conjecture by Debar, Aim, Lajefeld, and Voisin, who predicted that something like this might work. They said, you know, people should try looking at this. So, um, so for a class alpha in our lattice, NK of XC, um, we'll define the mobility count to be the following thing. MC of alpha is defined to be the maximum over non-negative integers b, such that uh, any b general points 
of x uh, are contained contained in an effective cycle of class alpha. Okay, so this is this is our first definition. So uh, let's think about what this means in a very familiar circumstance. Let's think for divisors. Okay, so for a divisor, to contain a general point of x is a codimension one condition on a family of divisors. So if you have a family of divisors, this is essentially asking, you know, for example, if you look, I've defined this numerically, but you know, you can imagine, you know, restricting attention to sort of a linear series, for example. This will exactly be picking up h zero of that linear series. Somehow, each time you have a divisor, you're getting you know, each point is forcing a codimension one condition on a family of divisors, so you're essentially measuring the dimension of that family. So this is, this is going to be some way of measuring, um, in general, how much cycles of class alpha move um, via these point incident counts. Okay. And then by the principle that I talked about before, we're interested not in just this, but we'd like to understand the asymptotics. So what we'd like to do is consider the mobility count of m times alpha as m goes to infinity. Okay, so this will be some sort of asymptotic measure of how much um, cycles of class alpha move. What? Um, I'll state a theorem later, which will be. That's right. Oh. That's right. Okay. Um, so it's not immediately obvious what this kind of thing is doing. So again, I'm just going to tell you how it works. The right heuristic to have in mind is to intersect hypersurfaces in Pn, where n is equal to the dimension of x. Okay. So let's try doing this, and then let's see what the mobility count looks like for these things. So, um, so let's remember in Pn, a degree d divisor contains about some constant times d to the n general points. So, um, you know, this is a very familiar fact. You know, the space of, uh, this is exactly sort of what we were referring to with the volume before, the deformation of a divisor grows like the degree to the n. Um, so if we intersect n minus k of them, We see that a k dimensional sub variety, so um, the, the dimension will be k, uh, the degree will be d to the n minus k, because degrees multiply. Um, and then this will contain, again, about some constant times d to the n general points, right? If you're intersecting divisors, n minus k of them, each containing this many points, you know, general points, well, you know, n minus k is very small compared to the number of points. So, you know, at the, you know when you do this process, the resulting subvariety will still contain about some constant times d to the n general points. So, um, what is this telling us?
Um, so by this heuristic, what we should expect is that the mobility count of m times alpha should grow approximately, approximately like some constant times m to the n over m minus k. Okay. This is a little bit weird to have a non-integer exponent in this situation, but somehow it's forced on us by he our heuristic, which, I'm again, I'm just going to tell you this is the right heuristic. Right? If we put in d to the n minus k for m, we should get d to the n out. So this is the expected growth rate of these point incidence counts. And um, again, we'd like to do some sort of asymptotic analysis of this, um, which leads us to make the following definition. The mobility of a lattice point um, in our vector space is defined in the following way. It will be the limb soup, as m goes to infinity, of the mobility count of m alpha over m to the n over n minus k over n factorial. OK. Um, so this is exactly capturing this sort of you know, asymptotic behavior, of this mobility count as m increases. And um, this expression should look very familiar. Uh, it turns out that this is actually, this is not immediately clear, but it, it's true. Um, that this is the volume for divisors. Again, when x is smooth. Okay. Um, of course, an important feature of this is that it doesn't depend on the smoothness of x anywhere. So this makes um, sense just as well for example, a Bay divisor class as it does for a Cartier divisor class. Yep. Um, so the, you should think of this MC as being approximately H0 for divisors. And I mean, that's not quite true, but morally speaking, that's what it's doing. So just like H0 measures the number of general points contained in um, a linear, of sort of divisors in a linear series, MC is measuring the number of general points in um, cycles contained in a numerical. So then the theorem, which again was conjecture, this was the conjecture by Debar, Ein, Lazarsfeld, and Blazan, um, says first of all that this mobility function extends to a continuous homogeneous function on all of NK of X. So this should be a little bit surprising, right? Here we've defined it for lattice points, and it's some sort of asymptotic count of you know, these point incidences. Um, it turns out that it's maybe not too surprising that this function is homogeneous. Um, it's not obvious, but it's not too hard to show. Um, but in fact, this function is also continuous. So um, if you're familiar with the volume, this is one of the key properties of the volume. Um, and as a consequence, we see that the mobility of a class alpha is positive um, precisely when alpha is big. Okay. This mobility function vanishes identically outside of the pseudo-effective cone. So by continuity, it's going to be zero on the boundary, and it's not too hard to, to see that it's going to be positive on the interior. Okay. So this is great. This is exactly what we were looking for. Um, it's some sort of geometric. Um, reasoning for understanding the boundary of the cone. Um, it sees pseudo-effective classes the same way as it sees effective classes, right? It doesn't distinguish. You know, when we define the pseudo-effective cone, we have this sort of subtle closure operation. Um, but somehow the mobility function just overlooks this strange closure operation and gives a geometric meaning to those as well. Yes? I, w 
I don't know if ample subschemes in the sense of autumn are big. Okay. Um, I, I've I talked to. I mean, I, I, I was yeah. thinking about this counterexample with ample normal bundle, which somehow seems not probably, maybe it's not the right transition, but maybe ample subschemes. Yeah, so this is some, certainly something I've thought about, and I've talked to JC about this, but um, neither he nor I have any idea how we might prove it. So, um, it's, it's a, that's a good question. That might be the right condition to put on, but I don't know. Uh, John Christian Autumn? Ah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should I have a question? Yeah, sure. Does this function satisfy some kind of a, how is it called, log concurrency or some kind of? Um, conjecture, I would conjecture that it would. Um, it's a little bit difficult to work with. I mean, yeah. yeah so so you, you might ask, you know, if it's continuous, is it C1 or C2? So again, I, w I would hope that it would be C1, but I, d I don't know of a proof. I'm sorry? Um, so it's hard to calculate. Um, <laughs> um, you know, let, so let me do a few examples. That's the next. That's the next topic. OK. Um, so let's start with x a Grassmannian. So I'll set n to be the dimension. Um, And let's suppose that alpha is a Schubert class. That is a class of a Schubert cycle on the Grassmannian. Um, so then the theorem implies usually, so most Schubert classes are not big, so um, usually the mobility count of m alpha is going to be bounded by some constant times m to the i for i less than n over n minus k, okay? Because um, usually alpha is not big. Okay, uh, the question is then, what is i? Okay, so this is a different perspective on a very sort of familiar example. Um, since most Schubert classes are not big, these sort of asymptotic point incidence counts um, say that you know, the, the expected growth rate is going to be less than n over n minus k. If you like, you might call this the Itaka dimension. Um, so what is the Itaka dimension of a Schubert class? Um, so I don't know in general. Um, the first example would be g24, and then alpha in n2 of x, a Schubert class. Uh, and then it turns out it doesn't matter which one you pick, they're the same. Um, so the mobility count of m alpha is equal to m. So they grow linearly. So this is sort of a, a well-known example. It's basically saying that if a surface in P3 has a two-parameter family of lines, then it must be P2. It must be a hyperplane. Okay. Um, more generally, this kind of question has been studied under the name of Schubert rigidity. That's sort of the Schubert rigidity. So um, that's the study of, you know, that's basically, um, it's a stronger kind of condition. It will guarantee that the Itaka dimension is zero. So there are some results in this direction, but I have no idea what to expect in general. So, um, th so the exponent of these things is something you can sometimes get your hand on. Um, to actually calculate a number is very difficult. So let's look at the next example. Uh, so for our next example, let's just take x to be p3 and uh, alpha to be the line class. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is our example. Um, how are we going to calculate the mobility? Well, it's essentially, it's governed by the following question. What is the minimal degree curve? through B, general points, of P3. Right. This, this is what the mobility count is doing. Um, so I've sort of flipped it around, but it's measuring the degrees of curves against the number of general points they contain. Okay. 
Um, the answer to this question is unknown. Um, and it's not just unknown by me. I've been asking everybody about this. It's really, <laughs> I mean, it's, re it's really unknown. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, somehow I find this question to be very compelling. Um, again, it's kind of fun to, to have people sort of think about what might be the right answer. Um, but I'm just going to tell you the conjecture, just for the sake of time. So this conjecture is due to Perrin in his thesis. Um, the conjecture, I mean, I'm going to say this you know, slightly imprecisely, that the optimal curves are complete intersections. Okay, I mean, this is somewhat remarkable, right? There's a whole zoo of curves on P3, but somehow the ones which maximize the number of points against their degree should be exactly the complete intersections. So he calculated the, this up to you know, some huge degree um, and verified it in that range. Um, this would imply that the mobility of the line class is equal to one, if it were true. So this is certainly what we would, you know, certainly what we would hope for. So. Okay. So this invariant is hard to, to calculate, but the volume is also hard to calculate. You know, if you're, if you're trying to calculate the volume of divisors and it's not related to an ample divisor somehow, you're sunk. Um, so let me just point out sort of another feature of these things. So even though they're hard to calculate, they behave well theoretically somehow. So um, so this example is a very special case of a much more general result that I worked on with Mihai Folger. Um, and it says that the mobility of a big curve class is approximated approximated by the mobility of the self-intersection of an ample divisor on a birational model. Um, so you should think of this as being a Fujita approximation result for the mobility, for curve classes. Okay? So even though we can't, <laughs> even in this example, we can't calculate the mobility, somehow it's not that far away. Um, if you could calculate the mobility of a, of a complete intersection of ample divisors, um, then by some sort of birational, you know, arguments, you could calculate it for an arbitrary big curve class. So this is saying that if, uh, so how should you think of this? If your curve class is the n minus first positive product, in the sense of Buxum Demaye Pound Petronel of a big divisor L, then the mobility is probably the volume of that divisor. So, you know, that's what this is saying, essentially. Um, I, I, well, assuming that you could calculate this again. Uh, I'd rather not elaborate now. You can come talk to me afterwards. Um, so for our next example, you can also do something uh, related, which is you can define the rational mobility of alpha instead of the mobility. Um, so let me write it first, and then I'll say what I mean. Um, so you can define the rational mob mobility of a class alpha by insisting that the cycles um, through the B general points be rationally equivalent. Okay. 
Uh, but let me emphasize, this is still defined on n k of x. OK. So the way that we define mobility it was essentially, well, we defined it as a numerical invariant. Um, but it was essentially an algebraic. So the cycles going through B general points will turn out by some sort of you know, countability argument, um, at least. Well, yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's measuring some sort of algebraic equivalence. But you can instead insist that um, let's take, let's um, calculate mobility count not by taking arbitrary cycles through B general points, but insisting that the, B, that the cycles through the points all be rationally equivalent and of, the, and of class alpha. Okay, so I'm still going to define this as an invariant on nk of xz. I'm basically looking at rational equivalence cycles, uh, rational equivalence classes inside of a numerical equivalence class. Okay. Uh, with this setup, the rational mobility satisfies exactly the same properties as the mobility. So it defines a continuous function on nk of x, or extends to a continuous function on nk of x, and it's positive precisely for the big classes. Uh, the advantage of doing something like this is that it's interesting even for zero cycles. Right? Uh, rational equivalence of zero cycles is something rather subtle, as opposed to sort of algebraic equivalence, which is not very interesting. Then we have the following proposition. Um, so here we should be safe. So we'll say x smooth over the complex numbers. Then the following are equivalent. Um, the first is that the rational mobility of the point class um, attains its maximal value uh, which is n factorial. Okay. So this is the maximal possible value, the rational mobility of a point. Um, the second condition, that the rational mobility of a point is larger than n factorial over 2. So there's some sort of discreteness here. Um, and the third property is that chow 0 of x is representable. Um, so representability is, of course, a very classic topic um, in the study of zero cycles. And it can be detected via this sort of asymptotic point count. Yes? Uh, what do, you mean, what does representable mean? Um, so the name comes from the fact that the, the degree zero, um, zero cycles are represented by an algebraic variety. So um, it means essentially that some or, you know, self product of x surge x onto the degree zero child group via natural map. Okay? So not a K3 surface. Yeah. What am I doing with that? Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know. So, you know, people are interested in this question not just for the sake of analyzing these cones but also for its relationship with other cycle-theoretic notions. So for example, this is why Claire Voisin first got interested in this kind of thing, as um, when she was analyzing the generalized Hodge conjecture for complete intersections, projective space, um, this notion of bigness naturally came up. Um, so, well, actually, I'm, I'm just going to stop here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do I know what the NEF cones are? Um, so the answer is no. Um, so the first thing to say is that Debar, Ein, Lazarus, and Voisin showed that the NEF cone does not need to be contained in the pseudo-effective cone. Okay. So this is very different from what, again, from what you know for divisors and curves. Um, I think that shouldn't be so surprising. So the general philosophy of these things, how do we define them? Um, cycles should be dual to churn classes of vector bundles. So nefness, you know, this dual notion should be a, a notion on churn classes of vector bundles and not of cycles. So we should really be trying to analyze the nef class I would propose, you know, via churn classes instead of sort of these other cycle theoretic notions of positive. Uh, 
Yeah, sorry, I was being a little bit imprecise about it. Let me, let me write it more carefully. Um, so the rational, mobi rational mobility, let me define the rational mobility count. And then it's defined via the same asymptotic calculation as before. The rational mobility count of a class alpha is a maximum non-negative integer such that, uh, um, let's see, how to say it? There exists some rational equivalence class tau inside of alpha such that any b points or general points of x are contained in an effective cycle of class tau, of rational equivalence class tau. Okay, so it's still a numerical invariant. It's just now capturing rational equivalence instead of algebraic. Yeah. Um. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it would be great if it was. I don't. I don't. I don't I don't think I have enough examples to hazard a conjecture at this point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Is the process for divisor uh, only on this mobility coincide or not? On a smooth divisor, yes, that's right. On any? On, sorry, on a smooth variety, yes. In for, any yes. Yeah. Okay. But, but again, you can define this in a much more general situation. Uh, oh, that was a question? Yeah? I mean, Yes. Um, yes, yes. So, um, so I would love to see sort of a formulation of this in terms of currents. I think, so even to compare the positive currents to the pseudo-effective cone, even for curves, is not known, if I understand correctly at this point. Um, so, and you know, you quite quickly get into sort of Hodge conjecture kind of issues when you try to compare currents to sort of what I've been doing here, which is purely algebraic. So I, absolutely, I would hope that there would be sort of an interpretation via currents and, you know, these, so this work with Mihai is actually doing some risky decompositions for these kinds of things. I would also hope that you could sort of look at the absolutely continuous part of a current and define it that way, but that's all very far away somehow. Um, I think there's a lot of background work that would need to be done first. Um, so this is something else that Mihai and I have been sort of discussing. It's a, it's a great question because it would give you a lot of stuff for free, right, if you could you know, define it that way. Um, we don't see a way to do it, but, m you know, maybe there is, and that would be terrific. Yeah. Um, so what you would expect was an element of, no, so, uh, since you asked. <laughs> <laughs> so is the risky decomposition is something like this. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> So what, what conditions do you put on this? So uh, a better analog would be the, the sigma decomposition of, of Nakayama. So this would be in the movable cone, which um, makes sense for any dimension. And it should somehow capture all the positivity of alpha, which maybe, as I've been suggesting, a good way to do that would be to, to require this. Okay. So, this is this, so, so for divisors, this is, this, this is the sigma decomposition. Um, for curves, the movable class is the NEF class. So you're getting NEF plus pseudo-effective just like you do for curves. On, this is the same as Risky's original construction for curves. You actually split it up into NEF plus pseudo-effective. So this. Not for curves. Yeah. 
But yeah, in general, this, you can't ask this to, this to be nav. It should be movable. I mean, and again, it's the same picture. Probably if you look sort of birationally, you can hope that this would be somehow positive. Yeah, I mean, I would, I'll give another talk on risky decompositions if you like, but some <laughs> other time. <laughs> so what kind of pressures do you get at the end? Um, so to acid actually be effective is too much. So we conjecture that it should be the push forward of a pseudo-effective class on a proper subvariety. That's somehow the right analog. Um, so th that would be the most important thing to sort of settle to get a good theory here. So we, we weren't able to prove that. Most, many of the other things that you'd look for. Are there further questions? 